Amen. Amen. All right, so today, uh, we're, you know, last week we talked about John 15. Today, it's, uh, it's John 17, and I've called this Connected to Christ, Part 2. We've been journeying through a couple of passages on John. And um, today, you know, I, I want to start with, uh, I want you to use your imagination here. I mean, imagine that I told uh, Stephen Bailey, my good friend Stephen Bailey, that, you know, in this envelope right here, that I've got um, a cash gift for him. Now, you know, if I just said it was an amount of money or if I said it was a cash gift for him, I mean, he could get a little bit excited. But then, you know, what if I upped the ante? What if I told him that in this envelope was a check for him for the same amount that I planned to leave Gavin as his inheritance when I go on, when I pass on and moved, move on to heaven? Now things get a little more exciting, don't they? I mean, at first, you know, if I say I've got an amount of money in here, I mean, that could mean anything. It could mean that literally there's one penny sort of dangling in the corner of this envelope, just so I'm truthful. You know, there is an amount of money in here, and I give it to him. No, no skin off my nose, no sweat off my back for that, right? But then I, I begin to unfold this story of how I want to give to him the same amount that I intend to give to Gavin as an inheritance. Now his eyebrows raise, maybe he rushes the stage to get this, right? It makes all the difference when I specify a quantity and I specify a quality uh, of this gift. Now, now Stephen, this, um, this envelope is empty, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. But, uh, but you get the point that, man, if, if I start getting specific... If I start getting exact about what's in here, then things get pretty exciting. Now, this morning in this passage in John 17, we're going to see that Jesus gets really specific about our inheritance. In fact, he gets really specific by saying not just that God loves us, but that God loves us in the same way that God loves Jesus, his son. Not just that we uh, share in a glory, but that we share in the same glory that God has shared with His Son. Uh, not just that we are close to God in some way, but that we are as close to God as Jesus Christ is close. And so, I don't know about you, but you know, maybe you found yourself in the spot I get in. I get in this spot where... You know, my feelings dry up. You know, I went to Sunday uh, church, you know, and man, the songs were good. And I was feeling this wonderful warmness, you know, that, that rolls over me during these Christian songs. And then I hear this, this message maybe at, at this church or anywhere, you know, messages can really stir up something within us. And we get this nice warm feeling and then we hit the parking lot, right? And then we hit out, uh, get, head out on the highway over here and I'd give it all oh, 10 minutes and either what, there's a screaming child in the back seat, or somebody cuts us off in traffic, or it's just, well, that was a great sermonette, and now I've got to head back to everyday life. And the feelings, uh, they can dissipate. The feelings can go. They're out the door. So what are you left with? Well, you're left with truth, but truth can't be nebulous at this point. If truth is a gray area, if truth is uncertain, if truth has been watered down, if truth has been balanced out with just a hint of error to keep it on the safe side, you know, we can't have that. Truth has to be very exact. And this morning in this passage, Jesus is going to be very exact about the type of love and the type of acceptance and the type of closeness that we have with God, and he's basically saying, you've got my deal. Just like Stephen would have Gavin's deal, right, with this envelope. You, we've got Jesus' deal, the same deal that Jesus has with God. So here's, here's Jesus, and he's praying, and he's about to take off, about to leave planet Earth soon. And what he says here is to his father, he says, now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. And I joke around a lot about joy, right? That's my favorite little imitation of the televangelist. When they talk about joy, they say it with a deep sort of breathy voice, right? And I know you want to say it with me. You always do. Say it with me, joy. Isn't that fun? Yeah, you should be on TV. Very convincing. 
But when we talk about joy, I mean, uh, sometimes we become numb to it. I mean, it's a Christian word. It's in the Bible. We sing it. It's in a song at Christmas time, maybe. Joy, 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 joy to the world. And, and yet, when we think about joy in any practical sense, I mean, we fail to define it uh, in any way that really helps us. Because let's be honest, we don't run around West Texas with a nice big smile on our face all the time. It's not like we're overcome with a sense of joy all the time. I mean, emotions ebb and flow. So what does it mean to have joy? Well, first of all, I want us to see the whole reason that Jesus is praying here is so that this joy can be um, made complete or come to fruition or be experienced within us. So uh, get this now. I mean, if Christianity turns your life stale, then you've missed it. Um, You know, if Christianity turns your life sour, then you've missed the point. Uh, Christianity is actually designed, God's rigged it so that something will well up within us that feels kind of positive, actually, not negative, right? Now, a lot of flavors of Christianity, they actually breed negativity. They breed an unjoy. They breed an unpeace because they breed things like fear and guilt and the idea of distance from God. But what, what Jesus is going to present in this prayer, and by the way, Jesus' prayers get answered. I know that's hard to believe, but Jesus prays all the right stuff, okay? And so even though this is a prayer, we're going to see how in the New Testament, this, this actually unfolds and Jesus' prayer gets answered and Jesus' prayer is about you. So what's so cool about this is this is not about the power of your prayer. It's about the power of Jesus' prayer. Number two, the prayer does get answered and the prayer benefits you without you even praying it. That's pretty cool. All right, so, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this three-letter word, uh, three word joy into another three-letter word. Let's call it fun. Now, I know I'm on the border of heresy at this point. Thank you for being patient with me. But spiritual fun, right? I mean, isn't that really what joy is? I mean... Because, you know, is, is it or is it not supposed to be fun to believe in Jesus Christ on a spiritual level? Is there spiritual fun in this? Let's look at the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, there's patience and there's kindness. Kindness has got to come from someplace, maybe even a fun place. Like, if you're not having some fun in life with Christ, how are you going to be kind to other people? I mean, you've got nothing left. Your tank is empty, you're miserable, you're gritting your teeth, making it through life, and then somehow you're supposed to be kind to other people and patient with them and and joyful in life. I mean, give me a break. That's not happening unless something at the core of your being is delighted. There's got to be delight. There's got to be some sort of spiritual fun. Now, I'm not saying that the circumstances are always fun. I mean, live on the planet more than a day, and you figure out really quick that circumstances are not always fun. I'm talking about within, where we're united with Christ. This relationship is supposed to be fun and freeing and liberating. Yesterday, I went to Schlitterbahn. Can you say that with me? Schlitterbahn. Be careful now. Watch it. Schlitterbahn, if you don't know, is uh, the world... They, they claim, now I don't know how they prove this, but they are the funnest water park in the world. Okay? They say they're the best water park in the world and that it's the funnest. Now, I don't know how they prove that, but it's, it's on their literature. So if you haven't been to Schlitterbahn, you need to go to Schlitterbahn. I dreamed of Schlitterbahn when I was, when I was a young boy in Virginia. I even heard of Schlitterbahn out east. And so now that I live in the west and I have a son, he's eight years old, I figured it's time. It's time for the joy of Schlitterbahn. <laughs> and let me tell you, yesterday we went and it was a joy. It was pure fun. It was wet, it was wild, it was crazy, it was beautiful. And what I wanted the most out of it was that Gavin have a great time. I mean, you know, I've been to this stuff, these kinds of things before, but what I wanted the most as a dad, I wanted him to experience the true joy that every young man should experience at Schlitterbahn. And he did. He loved it. He was thrilled by it. He tried a lot of different new things, and uh, we'll definitely go back. Now, 
for me to compare an experience like my heart for Gavin at a place like Schlitterbahn and then turn and compare that with the heart of God the Father in wanting our joy, what was it? How did he express it? That my joy made full in themselves? Uh, is that even allowed? You know, can we even think of God delighting in us to that degree? Can we even think God being God wanting us to have joy and have fun and have fulfillment? I mean, would he even consider that level of over-the-top excitement for us? And I think really the answer, of course, is all the more. I mean, I'm just, I pale in comparison. My, my desire for Gavin to have fun for a day pales in comparison to what God wanted out of the gospel for us. Remember, this gospel is not, not just for him. It glorifies him, yeah. I mean, God sending his son, dying, raising from the dead, it glorifies the power of God. But he did it so that you, so that we. So there's a so that here that we really need to take hold of, grab hold of, and see that this is so that we can experience joy, so that we can experience spiritual fun. So let's get back to the thought I had earlier. I mean, does your Christianity spell freedom? Does your flavor of faith, does it spell real life to you? Does it spell fun to you? Does it spell joy to you? Is it really over the top better than anything else you could be focusing your mind on? Because if it's not, I think we need to ask, what's missing? I mean, what's missing if Jesus is praying that our Christianity would bring joy to the fullest, then if we don't have this joy, and by that I do not mean the plastic smile, okay? I'm not trying to set up a phantom Christian here with a plastic smile all the time for you to aspire to, okay? I very much believe that the joy that we're talking about is the joy of a God who accepts me fully so I get to be me. He accepts me completely. He embraces who I am so that I don't have to, get this now, I don't have to have a personality or traits in my personality that come from the pressures of other people and what they want me to be. I don't have to be something for other people. I can be me and let the chips fall where they may because I've got a no holds barred, no strings attached acceptance and love and there's a peace about that, and there's also a fun about that. You know, there is a fun about you getting to be you and not having to be someone else and not having to impress other people and not having to live for other people, but you get to be who God has made you to be, and this is not some future you. I know a lot of people preach sermons about you get to be all that God created you to be, and that makes me think, am I, am I there yet? Am I there yet? Oh, I got to go be what I'm created to be. I'm not there yet. No, I'm saying that here, right here, right now, that God is crazy about the you that is you. And it's not a future you. It's a you right now. And so, you know, there is a liberty in that. And there is a freedom in that. There is a joy. We'll call it joy or fun or freedom or liberty. We'll call it all these things. A peace, a stability. There is something there when we get to be ourselves, Religion says you can't be you. You've got to be a better version of you. Religion says clean yourself up, dust yourself off, and try harder. And God, through the gospel, is saying you can be you, and I'm embracing who you are. And that's where the joy comes from. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Hated them. I mean, I don't know. If we took a survey, we went down the line, said, have you been hated? Have you been hated? Have you been hated? Some of us would say, yeah, very quickly. We'd say, yeah, and we could cite an instance where because of our faith, because of our relationship in Christ, that we have been hated. But many of us, maybe we haven't experienced it to the level that these guys, these disciples experienced. None of us, right? But um, there is something here because have you noticed that there's a whole lot of tolerance for God in this world? Man, you want to talk about God? That is so cool. Let's talk about your God, okay? Oh, you want to talk about faith? That's cool. Let's talk about faith. In fact, you're more electable if you talk about faith than you talk about God. If you don't talk about faith and God, then you're not very electable and you're not very socially acceptable. But now you bring Jesus Christ into it in a very specific way. 
Now, that is the name that we have curse words around, okay? That is the name that we sometimes damn with curse words around it. I mean, you can talk about Muhammad, and you can talk about Buddha, and you can talk about Allah, and you can talk about all kinds of of gods of this religion and that religion. You can talk about holy books, and we want to be real careful to not be offensive. But then Christians... We get painted as having some sort of crutch. You know, Christianity is our emotional crutch. And uh, Christianity is where you check your brain at the door. And so, you know, it's very interesting that the same people who will talk about tolerance of God and faith will then turn around and say that Christianity is an emotional crutch checking your brain at the door. And so there is an instinctive, what I'm getting at here, I'm not trying to talk politics or anything like that. What I'm trying to say is there is an instinctive, innate hatred for the name of Jesus Christ. Not saying that everybody has it or that everybody exudes it, but it's out there in the world. It is out there. Now, he also tells us that the reason that we're hated is not just because of Jesus. I mean, first of all, have you been hated? Well, You know, I said earlier, maybe not. But how about those awkward times, you know, when you're sitting with the other guys at at work over a beer or whatever, and things get a little crazy in the conversation, and now it's your turn, and you don't feel quite like you can say what you really want to say because what you think and feel doesn't fit with what they think and feel. I teach over at the university. What I think and feel among many people does not fit with what they think and feel. Um. And maybe you have a situation at work or at school or among friends, you know, they know you're a Christian and you feel awkward and they've labeled you and, you know, why is this here? Why can't it just be like every other tolerance? Well, it's here because there is something innate, there's something special about the name of Jesus Christ. You know, even in some some uh, religions that don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, this is interesting. In some religions that don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, they believe he was merely a prophet. You know what they say about him? They say that yet he was the only prophet who never died. Not crucified, but he just went right up there. Of all the prophets, just... Now, why would he get that special label or that special treatment? There's something about Jesus that's hard for us to wrestle with. Let's call him a stumbling block. And so as he's a stumbling block, then we try to categorize him and put him where we can. We don't want to offend anybody, but we don't want to go too far. And so the name of Jesus ultimately behind the scenes is hated and out in front on stage mildly tolerated. But then it says... They don't just hate you because of his name. They hate you actually because of who you are. Did you see that in the verse? That it's not just about Jesus. They hate you because you are not of this world. Now, uh, all you have to do is examine Hollywood for a little bit. And you see that we have a fascination with aliens. I mean, have you ever noticed that? That like, spoiler alert, okay? That last Indiana Jones movie, give me a break. I mean, he's supposed to be like a guy with a whip in caves, like exploring all kinds of old stuff. But at the end of this last movie, it's all about aliens and they come swooping down. I mean, come on, major disappointment, right? Sorry if I ruined that for you. You probably had it rented for tonight. But But I mean, movie after movie after movie is about people who are not of this world, visiting this world, or we go visit them. And so we have a natural fixation, right? A natural fascination with this idea of people from another place. I wonder why that is. Well, if everything we're saying this morning is true, this might be some, some part of the reason. Some part of the reason might be that we are designed to be people that don't have a home here. We are designed to be people who are not of this world. And everyone who has faith in Christ, we are actually away from home right now. Everyone who has Christ in them, we are away from home. We're a fish out of water. Things should feel awkward when we hit the world. Things should feel really, really strange sometimes. And so he says, because they're not of the world, by the way, just as Jesus is not of the world. We're very quick to say, oh yeah, Jesus, son of God, not of this world. Believe me, walked on water, healed the blind, 
picked up the lame people off the ground, not of this world, definitely. Well, Jesus is saying, look, look at the envelope. On the front of the envelope, it says, same as the Father has given me. Your identity, your home, your inheritance, your closeness, your cleanness, your rightness, it's the same as what Jesus has. So we can't look in the envelope. That's the trick. We can't look in the envelope right now. Heaven gives us an opportunity to gaze into the envelope for eternity and fathom, begin to fathom it all. But right now, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And so there's a little label on, on the outside of the envelope through the Word of God. It's saying we have the same as Jesus. Anytime you're wondering what's in the envelope, the answer is same as Jesus. <laughs> same as Jesus. So there I am, groveling on the ground at 19 years old, begging God for answers, saying, God, I feel dirty, I feel distant. What did I need to know? Same as Jesus. Same as Jesus. Not same as you generated yesterday. Not same as matches your recent performance. Same as Jesus Christ, because it's a gift. I do not ask you to take them out of this world, okay? Well, we might be asking that. How many times have you prayed a prayer against that, against this prayer? Jesus has his prayer, John 17, and you're over here praying the opposite. Lord, get me out of here, right? Okay, maybe not out of this world. I don't want the pain of physical death. Get me out of this circumstance. Take me out of this place that I'm in. And so we pray that we would get out of the place that we're in, trial, some sort of trouble, some sort of stress, some sort of relationship, some sort of mystery that can't be solved. I mean, I had an illness uh, that wasn't diagnosed for 25 years. I had, a, I had a, a headache every day of my life, like a, I would say, you know, half as strong as a migraine, a bad migraine, half that strong, roughly, but on and off, all day long, every day for 25 years. Didn't know what it was. Tried 10 different solutions. Praying, praying once a week. Praying uh, every night at some, time, at some points. I'm saying, Father, you know, please show me what this is. Please show me what this is. Why, God, why would you let this go on? Why would you let this happen? And then, you know, some 25 years later, I find out I've got this blood disorder. I start giving blood. It gets treated. Boom. Headaches start going away progressively. Till now, they're nearly non-existent. So, I mean, you look at stuff like that and you pray, get me out of this. Take me out of this circumstance. And what we want sometimes is to escape the pain and escape the circumstance. And we imagine that God wants exactly what we want because we define we define his plan a certain way, and we superimpose that on him. And so then we say, God, surely this is your agenda. And he says, don't call me Shirley. <laughs> that one was free. <laughs> but I mean to tell you, we pray certain things, don't we? And we pray with an agenda of take me out of this world. And then what God is saying is, I've got a different agenda. Um, it involves um, yesterday's attitudes no longer being today's attitudes. Yesterday's opinions and thoughts about you and about me no longer being today's thoughts and opinions about you and about me. You know, if I hadn't gone through what I went through, at that time I thought, you know, I was naive enough as a teenager and a young adult, I was naive enough to put a God label on all of those headaches. And I thought God was ticked at me, God was upset at me, God was frustrated at me, and that there was a victorious Christian life out there that felt way different than I feel physically. And that if I could get there, I'd really be in good shape. But look at poor, miserable me who has to deal with this. God must really not like me. And so I grew out of that, but not by escaping that. I grew out of that within that, if that makes sense. I grew out of that while dealing with that circumstance so that I could divorce the physical from the spiritual. And I could say that no matter what's happening to my body, this is no indication about how the God of the universe feels about me. 
that God is, is saying worship him in spirit and in truth with no guarantee that the body is going to be healed on this side of planet earth. I don't ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one, protected, safe, new thoughts, new attitudes, renewing of the mind, but not escapism. Then he repeats this again, guys. I mean, he says it twice, apparently, in this prayer. I mean, he knows he's going to be quoted, right? He knows, he knows he's going to be quoted on this matter, and he brings it up twice. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, this is sort of why we do what we do at Church Without Religion. You'll notice that if you go down the street to another church, I can promise you that many churches are going to have way bigger programs than we have. Um, They may have uh, better features to their church. Um, They may have all kinds of programs, and there's other denominations out there. There's also many music styles out there. Um, Imagine if Jay and the music team here were to try to uh, cater to all of our music styles, right? So the first song is uh, country style, okay? The second is kind of a slow traditional. The third is rap, okay? Yeah, I mean, I know that's what he likes. It's okay. He's forgiven. (laughs) But the issue here is it's not about a style. It's not about a program. It's about content, isn't it? I mean, we could, we could bring in a whole lot of fancy-dancy speakers in here who travel the circuit all the time. They're $50,000 a pop or whatever. We could get denominational label on the wall outside. We could get all kinds of music styles in here. We could get more programs. But this right here, staring us in the face, this is the most important thing. And that is, are we talking about God's truth? Because the truth is what sets us free. It's people walk away with content. You remember that feeling I was talking about earlier? You might walk away with some feelings, and that's fine. I mean, God has created us as emotional critters. We are emotional people. We're designed to feel. So I might hit the parking lot on a level nine. I'm feeling pretty sweet, right? But then two miles down the road, I'm sitting at a seven. And then by Monday morning, I'm down at a four, just like I was last week. Okay, well, emotions ebb and flow. That's the soul. Emotions come and go and ebb and flow. But this is what sets us apart, truth. You know what sanctify means, right? Sanctify means set apart. So the most important, get this now, the most important thing in all of this, the most important thing is what we believe. We are sanctified, we are set apart by what we believe. And works Just flow from that. People say, oh, don't emphasize belief too much. we got to have works. Well, don't you believe that you're redesigned for good works? If you don't believe that, you can forget the works. The works are not coming from faith. So we're trying to balance the faith and the works. And what God is saying is the faith results in works. So focus on the faith. You're set apart by what you believe, not by what you do. There are plenty of doers who have outdone you. There are plenty of doers out there who do way more than you do. It is not about what you do. It is about what you believe. And what you do comes from what you believe. And So this is why he says sanctify them. In other words, set these people apart in truth. Not in emotion. Not in performance. But sanctify them by what they believe. Because that's the most important thing. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. There's our mission, our purpose, not to go try to be salt and try to be light. No, that's not it. Jesus says we are salt and we are light. That's identity. It's not doing. I can't get salty. I'm salt. I can't get lighty. More more lit. Oh, I can get more lit. (laughs) Believe me. But in moderation. (laughs) Lit in moderation. But it's an identity statement, isn't it? Salt and light. For their sakes, I sanctify myself. Wait a minute. Jesus sanctifies himself. What does he do? More quiet times? What does this even mean? I sanctify myself. 
What, does he go to church more often? Does he like sing a few hymns and then he feels more sanctified? Is Jesus progressively being sanctified? You know, we, we toss this word sanctify around in wrong ways. And then when we see Jesus doing it, we're like, oh, my definition doesn't fit, right? What am I going to do? So for their sakes, I sanctify myself. What does that mean? It means I set myself apart, Father. I am setting myself apart. I am reserved for this purpose, this vision, this mission. It involves a cross, a tomb, and a resurrection. And I set myself apart for this mission, Father. Why? So that they, that's us, so that they themselves also can be set apart in truth. I am doing this so that they can be reserved for you forever. So next time you don't feel like God's guy or God's gal, next time you don't feel like God's real happy with you or that you're real close to him or real set apart or real that he's even remotely pleased with who you are, remember that the whole purpose of the gospel, the whole purpose in Jesus reserving himself for this mission was so that you could be set apart and reserved for God seated right next to him. He did this for you. It's not even about how great you were. We weren't great. It's about how great he is and how great his mission is. And mission accomplished. That's the point. Can you put the focus, can you put the focus on mission accomplished instead of putting the focus on how well you've been doing? See, that's what the finished work of the cross is. We use that phrase all the time. The finished work, the finished work, the finished work. What does that even mean? It means that we believe the mission was accomplished. And if God accomplished the mission, and the mission was designed to make you clean and close, well, then guess what? God succeeded. He succeeded. So why are you measuring your success when you need to be measuring his success? I do not ask on behalf of these alone, not just these guys sitting on rocks around me in Jerusalem. No, not just these disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Hey, that's us. We believe because of their word. Peter, James, John, later Paul, because of their writings, we believe. So this whole thing is not just for a small group of ragtag disciples. It's for us. That they may all be one, even... As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I love this because it's a rare use of the word us, right? God rarely describes himself as us. I think he does back in, in Genesis, right? In Genesis, at the creation story, he talks about we. Here he's calling himself us. And what he's saying, remember, let's go back to that offer to Stephen Bailey. What he's saying is the offer is just as good as God's offer to Christ. That's what he's saying here. That they, that's us, that they may all be one even as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. In other words, I'm in the envelope, enveloped in Christ, and Christ is enveloped in me, and then we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and the entire trinity called us in this verse the entire Trinity is pleased to have you. Now, that's an awesome thought. Wherever I go, there's four of me, right? Me, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit put together, enveloped. I'm never alone. So that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me. Oh, man, I can't finish this verse. It's heresy. Look at this. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Are you serious? No, surely. Oh, watch that, surely. Surely, definitely, in the original language, possibly, maybe, it would say something different, right? No, glory is glory. The glory, Father, which you have given me, I have given to them. Right now, I know what we talk about. The guy on the in the football game, you know, the camera zooms in, and he points up, and he says, "I give all glory to God and to Mama." <laughs> right? He's thanking his Mama, and he's thanking his God, and the touchdown just happened, and he spikes the ball, and he's giving. Don't give me the glory. No, no, no. Don't give me the glory. Give the glory to God. Don't look at me. Aim the camera up to heaven. Right? I don't deserve, I'm not worthy. 
And then the gospel says the polar opposite. God's saying, glory, I don't need more glory. Are you kidding me? Nice touchdown, but seriously, I don't need more glory. How about I give some glory to you now? Now, it's glory as a gift. It's Christ's glory given to us. But man, you got to own it. Because you're going to need it. We keep, you know, we get phone calls. Can I lose? I, maybe I've lost my salvation. Can I lose my salvation? I don't feel saved anymore. We're asking the wrong question. We're asking, have I lost something? And God is saying, look what I've given you. On top of salvation, I've given you my glory. I'm fully pleased with you. I'm crazy about you. I have shared my DNA with you. You're my child. You're born of the Spirit. I've shared my glory with you. And you're asking if you lost your ticket to heaven? Like, you're talking about a destination, and I've done way more than a destination. I've infused my life within you. The glory that I gave Christ, I've given to you so that you would be one just as we are one. Now try praying that prayer, you know, Lord, make me clean, make me close. Well, wait a minute, we're one. Would I ever pray, Lord, make Jesus clean? Lord, make Jesus close to you. Father, I just pray that Jesus would get close to you. Ridiculous. We would never pray it. He says that we're one just as Jesus is one. Why are we begging for what we already have? Sounds like we need to be setting our minds on this and saying thank you. I am them and you and me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them. Here's the envelope again. Loved them, let's see, let's see, how much? Oh, even as much as God loves Jesus. Yeah. Woo. (laughs) I woo you as well. I receive your woo. I transmit back to you one woo. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, that's really cool. We're finishing up one, a couple verses left. We're not going to belabor it, but look at this. I am a gift from God to Jesus. Do you see that's what Jesus is praying here? Father, remember, it's not disciples now. Too late for that. It's you, okay? It's you. And he says, Father, the ones you have given me, like he's actually grateful, like I thought he was mildly annoyed that I was involved in this. Apparently, he's grateful that I'm in this. He's grateful that you're in this. He's thankful to the Father. Thank you for those whom you you have given me. Now he prays that they would be with me where I am. Did that come true? Yeah, Ephesians 2. Raised us up, seated us with Christ right next to God. This, This came true. So that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. You know what that is? He's saying, these guys know my identity. There are people that will tell you Jesus Christ is merely a prophet. Jesus Christ was a great teacher. Let me tell you, if he was a teacher alone, he was a sorry, sorry teacher. Right? You've heard what C.S. Lewis said so famously long ago. But, I mean, give me a break. A guy that runs around town teaching people that he's God, well, he's either right or he's nuts. That's not a good teacher. If someone, if you heard that someone was out in Plainview right now, out in the fields of Plainview, proclaiming, standing on a rock, saying that they were God, what would you think of that person? Let's all flock out there and take notes? No, let's have the cops pick them up real quick, right? Because something weird is going to happen next. So Jesus leaves no place for himself to be a mere teacher. He's either right about himself or he's totally nuts. And so he says, we've figured out who he is. These have known that God sent Jesus. The identity of Jesus Christ, that he is who he testifies to be. This is not multiple choice theology. This is it. Because if he is who he says he is, then oh my Lord... He is. Wow. If he is who he says he is, then he is the creator, 
then everything he said is true, which means he really does live in me, which means he really does want to live through me. He owns everything. He is my everything. Everything hinges on the identity of Jesus Christ. And I have made your name known, Father. I've made it known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me, right here, the love with which you loved me may be in them. Romans says, the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by faith. We have the love of God in us and we have Christ in us. We are connected forever. And that's something to celebrate. Let's pray together. Father, uh, we try to pray against the prayer of Jesus. We pray that we would have new circumstances. That doesn't happen sometimes. We pray that we would be close. You say we are close. We pray that you would come back into us because we've lost you. You say you never leave us nor forsake us. We pray against your prayers sometimes, and we don't want to do it anymore. Instead, we want to pray in line with you, along with you, and we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you, not for a religious self-improvement program, but instead for something that brings spiritual fun, something the world doesn't have, something that makes us have the best thing going on the planet. And what's not to like, Father? You have loved us. You have liked us. You have accepted us. You've embraced us. You've called us your own. You'll never revoke your love. What is not to like? We thank you for this gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand up and sing this little song with me again. Some glad morning when this life is over I Flowery to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. Well, I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, fly and by. Um, you know, various words flying around, spiritual words, words like joy and fullness. And what I don't want you doing is going away with some lofty notion that you must achieve to. I think we need to be reminded that the ultimate sense of joy is knowing that we don't have to have that smile, that we can be ourselves, that God is pleased with who we are. He's pleased with our disposition He's pleased with our personality. He embraces who we are. We don't have to live for other people. We don't have to change ourselves for other people. The kind of joy that the Christian life really breeds is a joy of a person who knows that they are fully loved, fully accepted, fully embraced, and that they need no changing at the core. That God is overwhelmingly for us because we have the same deal as Jesus Christ. Have a great day.